This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Mark Thornton Burnett, Professor of Renaissance Studies at Queen's University, Belfast. Among his many contributions to scholarship on Shakespeare and early modern studies, Mark has been deeply involved over recent years with Shakespeare in world film and Shakespeare in global adaptation. This involvement includes an enormous amount of research, but there are two of Mark's books that we will focus on first, Shakespeare and world cinema, and more recently, Hamlet and World Cinema. Mark is a trustee and director of the British Shakespeare Association and a fellow of the English Association and also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Mark, your work is so compendious and far-reaching that any attempt to summarize it quickly just wouldn't pass muster. In recent years, you've done an enormous amount of work on Shakespeare in film, specifically world or global cinema. This area overlaps with another interest of yours, and that being global Shakespearean adaptation. This focus on global media and adaptation was an extra gear that you found after your earlier and very significant contributions to scholarship on Shakespeare and early modern drama. So in the context of two of your more recent books, the first being Shakespeare and world cinema, the second, and most recent being a direct focus on Hamlet and world cinema, both of these, even without the exquisite critical analyses that you offer, gather vast amounts of valuable data and also bring up some big, indeed global questions about media and adaptation. Big questions or even arguments about what qualifies as Shakespearean. I would like to ask you to describe your own standard for what qualifies as Shakespeare and comment on how comfortably or uncomfortably you are positioned alongside other, let's say, more rigid views. For starters, though, at what point is it Shakespeare or not Shakespeare, Hamlet or not Hamlet? Gosh, that's a, a very challenging question for first thing Monday morning, Tom, but <laughs> a very, very important question too. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity as well to, to talk to you. It's our pleasure. Uh, so, uh, so I guess an older paradigm of, of adaptation studies would be to compare the original play with the adaptation, and often to the detriment of the adaptation, so that the original is, is canonized and, and pedestalized and, and, and seen as in some ways superior and the adaptation in some ways inferior. Thankfully, that, that view is being superseded, and we now have a recognition of adaptation studies uh, as a very important field, uh, not just that, but also adaptations themselves as of value in their own right. So I guess that's be, that would be where I would align myself in terms of, you know, what's Shakespeare and what, what's not Shakespeare. I value the not Shakespeare. I value the adaptations. Uh, I also think it's important in valuing the adaptations to keep in mind the, the, uh, the Shakespearean text with which it has a relationship, but always in a, in a kind of competitive and a struggle for primacy kind of a way. Yeah, if we put the same standard, if we applied the same standard to Shakespeare, of course, the same thing could be said, because, you know, he's gathering from materials, it's a stream. And I, I kind of like to envision yes, it as this, yes. this big river. And of course, Shakespeare is a wide point in the river, but it's a stream of cultural influence that goes well before Shakespeare into Shakespeare, and on outward. And why, why even think of discouraging it, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, we need to get away from the idea that there's a point of origin. Uh, there are, there are cycles, of repetition, cycles of repetition and cycles of creativity. And, and, and Hamlet is, is, a, is a perfect instance of that, because, of course, 
Shakespeare's Hamlet didn't spring out of the, 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 the dramatist's imagination fully formed. It, it, it itself was part of a process, you know, and we, we know that from all the excellent work being done by, by, um, by textual critics of Shakespeare. Yeah. And in terms of Hamlet as an adaptation, I think that was the other part of your question. Um, so is it Hamlet? Is, an ad is a film adaptation of Hamlet Hamlet? I'd say, yes, it is, but just in a, in a slightly different form. Um, I think of a film like um, a Brazilian film, O Yoga da Vida e da Morte. It's a 1971 adaptation of Hamlet or a, a South Indian film, Karma Yogi, um, 2012. These are adaptations that take the liniments and, and the, the, the impetus of Hamlet, but they, but they repurpose the play either by subtract, subtraction or, in fact, by addition, so that we end up, to, to, to refer to my previous answer, with an adaptation that, that, that is of value in its own right. Yeah, I, I, I completely uh, am with you here. Of course, I'm in Japan, and uh, you, you really can't expect an entire other nation with a language of its own for centuries and centuries to encounter... Well, would we expect it of the Germans when they translated Shakespeare into German? Would we expect it? You know, we, we do have this West-East divide, and there is that. But the, the fact of the matter is, why can't someone translate into their own language and use their own concept and fuse it, as it's been done many times in, yeah. in Japan and also in India? Uh, otherwise, it, it can't survive. You can't uh, transport a 16th century or a Victorian Shakespeare into a completely different culture. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you've, you've mentioned that because the, the other the huge aspect of all of this is, of course, translation. What happens when Shakespeare's plays are translated into languages that, that, are, that are not English? And I would say the same thing as per adaptation. Translation is, is a further facilitative and creative act that, that actually, uh, as, as, as I have found uh, in working on Hamlet, takes you back to Hamlet and makes you look at Hamlet differently. Yes, I, it's a tiny detail here, but I was working recently on a on a, an African adaptation of of Hamlet uh, uh, in French with with some African languages, and there's the um, the, the translation of that particular uh, representation of the ghost. The ghost is described as most Lazar like in in Shakespeare's Hamlet. That that had never kind of resonated with me in the French in mediated in the African production it becomes common lepre like like a leper so there's a whole association there of leprosy and disease and the ghost mm -hmm. that yeah. uh, came to life for me through the act of translation yeah yeah uh, that you don't see even in your own native tongue uh, and of course, we have studied this, you know, and yeah. we feel as if we maybe have gotten it all. And there, there isn't a year that passes by where yeah. I don't see something just like this, you know, yeah. and I'm yeah. sure that happens with you all the time uh, as you're gathering. I'm interested in if I'm interested in the notion if there are still people out there who feel that Shakespeare should be in English and even film is getting away from the purity of the whole thing. Uh, are there people out there who are active scholars working who reject the notion of any Shakespeare off of the stage, maybe even off of the page uh, and, and protest that let's say that a Shakespeare in another language in Chinese or Japanese mm. or any of the many languages across the globe. Mm. Do you think there are people out there who are still holding up to that? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that's an older construction. Yeah. Um, it, it's a tenacious one, um, but it's <laughs> one that recent developments in adaptation studies are, 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 are challenging. And I mean, I, I, I'd say, you know, with reference to, um, to Japan, of course, you know, the great, uh, the great example of, of, of Shakespeare being translated into cinema in Japan is Kurosawa and, and Throne of Blood really uses very little of Shakespeare's language. And yet it's, it's such a marvellous reinvention of the play, such a, such a marvellous resituating of the play in, in, in samurai Japan that uh, ined inevitably Shakespeare's 
Macbeth takes on all sorts of fresh complexions. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Now let's get to your books. Let's start with uh, Shakespeare, World Shakespeare and then move to, Shake, uh, to Hamlet, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, for a while I was thinking about a historical approach. So mm -hmm. you, you start at the advent of film and you move up to the present. Uh, that didn't seem quite to do it. Then I thought about uh, an approach that would look at decades. That didn't seem quite to do it. So of the various approaches that I had on the table in front of me, I suppose what I did eventually, and that is reflected in the, in the book you're describing, I, I, I prioritized three choices. I prioritized the, the choice of the auteur, the individual creative practitioner. Mm -hmm. I, I prioritized the choice of a, a regional or a nation specific approach. And I prioritized uh, the approach of looking at an individual play. Any one of those approaches would have done for a whole study. Mm -hmm. But I wanted, I suppose, three different entrance points into Shakespeare and Will's world cinema to, to try and give a flavor of the, the richness and the, the diversity and the complexity. Yeah, and you chose two plays, Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet, and of course- I did. Yeah. And then I felt a bit bad about it because I'd neglected <laughs> Hamlet, so- <laughs> so, they, so let's go I to Hamlet. To something else. <laughs> yeah, well, Hamlet now has a full book. And this is, uh, you start with Western Europe. And mm. uh, I think in the, earlier book and maybe in this book also we we talked about the problem of there being the west and the rest yes. right that there there seems to be an overemphasis on the english speaking cultures uh north america well the uk and north america of yes. course and uh, uh but you start there and then you move out to uh africa and brazil mm -hmm. china mm -hmm. and japan and then you look into regional paradigms and mm. also uh, Turkish Hamlet and Iranian. I love that anecdote you had about getting a, a permission to enter Iran, right? It, but this, this thing has taken you on adventures. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and to, um, uh, which involves going to archives, um, doing a lot of, detective work and in, in trying to find titles, um, meeting with practitioners, and uh, really enjoying and thrilling to and being excited by the whole project. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly parodic mode of organization. Yeah, I see what you mean. And also coming across these things, uh, Mark, I don't think there is the, ap the cultural apparatus out there that can preserve these works. And we're talking about film. And mm. we think of, you know, I, I, I'm sure you've had this experience. I have trying to remember a film that I loved mm. 400 years ago, you know, when I was young and yes. trying to find it. And some yes. films of the period are there, some very fine films, yes. but then this particular film is missing. And in the in that time, it wasn't an insignificant film. It was right there with the others that had been preserved. So uh, it's not for some reason. And of course, that's something that I've been interested in throughout my career. So why something survives and why yeah. it doesn't. And yeah. you, it might be simply because uh, <laughs> Mark Burnett didn't come along and put it in a book that, you know, was published mm -hmm. by Cambridge University Press, and then somebody else picks it up later on, you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we have it. Do you, do, do you think that there is a way that these things, because it's film, uh, can it be digital, digitally preserved as, as a film? Are there uh, repositories where these films can, can have mm -hmm. a, a safe uh, home mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. years afterwards? Are those, mm -hmm. is that possible? Uh, it is possible, and it's increasingly being done. And I think the reason why one film is extant and another film isn't, it's to do with the, the accidents and the contingencies of distribution. Uh, if a film garners international festival exposure, it has a, a longer shelf life. If it doesn't, if it circulates only within a, a narrower set of parameters, uh, it's potentially more short-lived. Uh, there are films that I, I wanted to talk about in that book, but I couldn't because they were absolutely lost. 
there's no way they could have been there. recovered. Some surviving only in stills, uh, others just having been, been thrown out when a, a studio closed. The concomitant problem, of course, is that in an older form, a film uh, was made on nitrate acetate stock, and that can decompose. So you get to a point where a film has decomposed so much, it's irrecoverable. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I did manage to, to um, come across some that I, that I, I, I thought would be more difficult to, uh, to locate. Uh, but then there are all sorts of ar archival questions that, that you, uh, you come up against as well. Archives can open and close, and that depends upon state funding. Yeah. Uh, other archives can have policies whereby they only start at the modern period and work backwards as opposed to starting in the, the silent period and working forwards. And, and by that, but by the time that happens, a whole history has disappeared. One lovely example, I, I think it's lovely, is of an African Hamlet adaptation, Hamili, from 1964, that was thought lost. It was then found in a in the Library of Congress, actually in Washington in a televised recording and that recording has been digitized and is uh, available uh, back in Ghana now where the film was originally made. Yeah, I spoke with Alexa Joben uh, a little over a year ago and the MIT Global Shakespeare's project, they seem to have something set up there yeah. ready to yes. uh, preserve yes. and what a, what a great thing. Right. Exactly. That's another fantastic, fantastic digital resource that is doing great work in all of these areas. Um, the, the problem, and if I were at Hyde Park Corner now and there were a box out there, I'd probably stand on it and scream this out to the world. But there is, I don't know whether it's more so in Japan or whether I just live here and I see it and you would see it if you lived anywhere else. But the, the, the uh, reluctance in some cases to uh, to to put a production in a situation where it's out of it's out of the mainstream you're not going to make a lot of money on it just make it available right and mm -hmm. in in doing so there might be some kind of income flow that is created for whatever but the reluctance to do that with uh, let's say just regular staged plays right where you make a, a simple recording uh, you you know I, I think back to when I, I was I studied at the Shakespeare Institute before it became the Shakespeare Institute. I'm aging myself. But, you know, would I love to see uh, Patrick Stewart again playing, um, you know, Barbas? He, he was just wonderful. He had his wonderful, you know, Barbas. And other examples, Glenda Jackson and uh, Peter yes. Brooks, Antony and Cleopatra. Yes. Uh, were that preserved, right? Uh, it's yes. just, a, yes. just a, a splendid stuff. But we didn't think of it. Well, the BBC at that time was thinking in that way. And they did a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that Ian McKellen, Edward II, which is mm -hmm. just stunning. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't do that much, did they? they you, you've mm -hmm. seen that mm -hmm. one, I'm sure. That, I, I and, haven't seen it, but I've heard the recording. Yeah, well, they, they just it's just simple camera work, a few close-ups here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just outstanding mm -hmm. uh, and very, very usable in a teaching situation. Sure. Well, I, we've been talking about you as a writer uh, of books from the Cambridge University Press, but you're also doing two things at once. I don't know how you find the time to do this, but you're the general editor of a series on adaptation, and you're also working on a specific edition, and at the same time, in, uh, including articles in that edition, uh, specifically Indian Shakespeare's. And I'm yeah. interested in what's going on with the uh, Indian uh, yeah. Yeah. influence there. Um, so the, uh, the series you mentioned, Tom, that's, that's Shakespearean adaptation. We, we, we started that this year with, with Bloomsbury Academic. Mm. Uh, and it's a series of studies, both book length studies and edited, edited uh, collections. On the theme of Shakespearean adaptation, it seems to be a very important topic to, to prioritize at the moment. I guess there are two distinctive things that we're doing with it. One is that it has a global reach, uh, and the other is that we're we're looking back in history. So it's it's not just adaptation as a contemporary phenomenon, it's adaptation as a as a historical phenomenon phenomenon. 
um, we, we do have an edited collection in, in that series that I'm involved in called Women in Indian Shakespeare's. And um, that came out of, a, a, of an accident of, of, of two funding applications, one to the Levy Human, one to Marie Curie, simultaneously being successful. So I don't quite know how that happened, but I was lucky enough and in the privileged position to be working with two postdoctoral scholars, um, Dr. Ter Buckley and Dr. Rosa Periaggio. And we formed a, a, a grouping at Queen's um, and all had this common interest in, in, in Shakespeare and, and Indian cinemas. Seemed the logical thing to, uh, to collaborate on yeah. a volume that reflected those interests. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what you come up, what you have come up with, uh, what you, yeah. uh, you're, well, that's just out. Is that right? That's just um, out. Not or, quite. Not quite. Not quite. Oh. I don't think so. Um, it's uh, so the, the, the idea for that book, Women in Indian Shakespeare's, I guess it was a two pronged approach. One was that we, we, we wanted to explore ideas of, of women in representation, but we also wanted to look at uh, women as creatives. Mm. Um, so the, the book is balanced between the, the sort of, uh, sort of um, it, it, it navigates a course between the critical and the creative. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have we have a roundtable with creative practitioners, uh, d directors, translators, uh, but we also have essays on on the representation of women and women characters in a variety of media, including uh, translation, film, and uh, popular press. Right. So the title there is "Women in Indian Shakespeare," soon to be out, and yes. you have uh, all kinds of other things it seems in the hopper there with that series and yes you, may, may i ask you what we can expect to see uh coming coming forward you, here with the you, you may yes. yes um so there's that title uh just published is a book by bill carroll uh on macbeth adapting macbeth really terrific book very happy to have that launching the series yes uh, we have another collection coming out on romeo and juliet uh later in the year uh, and then we have a, um, a collection, a Lockdown Shakespeare, uh, on uh, the phenomenon of Shakespearean performance uh, during the pandemic, and, and that's almost out. So the, the, the four titles out this year, um, we'll, we'll be having an online book launch later in the year, and there are other titles under contract and, and in preparation. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that there'll be some longevity. Oh, I, I think there certainly will. Uh, now, <laughs> this is just, it's, um, it's kind of overwhelming me a little bit here because I'm thinking like, a, I do some digital uh, humanities scholarship yes. and I'm thinking like that at this time, that there seems that, it seems to me that there should be a way to enter this into a kind of da a data set uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. and I, think that I read somewhere where somebody might be doing uh, mm. something like that, but there's so much here, Mark, that uh, mm. is, is, uh, can, can be reshaped in so many different ways that- Well, yes, it, there is, but there's still a lot more to do. I mean, it, and, and it's very interesting you, you talk about data collection. Um, you know, Alexa's um, MIT, uh, resource global Shakespeare is, is absolutely fantastic. I mean, there are others out there as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. there, there's one called Asia, um, and you know there are hard copy books. That there's a, there's a collection called Shakespeare's After Shakespeare, edited by Richard Burke. All of these yeah. are are magnificent efforts to capture the diversity and, and variety of the field. There's still more more examples that we don't know about, and that and that we we need to, to, to capture. Somewhere there's some massive collaborative um, uh, enterprise that would that would involve uh, scholars from from all around the world uh, in an ongoing basis. And Alexa has the the Paul Grave Encyclopedia of Global Shakespeare. That's also wonderful. Um, uh, it, it's 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 a, a, a it's a fantastic opportunity that we you know we're we're, we're still um, uh, still finding things to say and, and things to find out. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, I, just more and more every day. And I feel more, and I think that you and I probably do share this, that we were schooled in a certain way. Now, I had several sure. just absolutely superb teachers. I, it, it's inspirational, obviously, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, taking a, a guy like me from the American South, who's supposed to go into some kind of sales job, I don't know, you know, and uh, finding a way to make that guy love Shakespeare. They had to be great yeah. teachers. But yeah, there was sure. a way of seeing it right that we at that time we felt more liberalized at the time but basically we were you know shared a sort of colonial perspective an iconic shakespeare the the great genius which there is genius there but uh over time as we've seen this uh unravel then that has opened up so much more in yes. critical interpretation hasn't it and yes yes it, it certainly has um i mean i was in the fortunate that position to be taught by um, a scholar of literature and a, a scholar of history, Emrys Jones and, and Keith Thomas. So yeah. I always had a kind of literary historical uh, bias in my training. And um, I wasn't particularly interested in adaptation or film in, in um, the work I did earlier, but I probably still do try to use those historicist methods which were inflected yeah. by new historicism in the 90s, in the, in the 1980s and the 1990s, when I think about adaptation. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember very well the uh, work that you did on masters and servants servants uh, in, in the 90s. We say in the 90s, but that had that's still out there. Uh, that whole idea of dominant, subdominant that you pulled out as, as a historicist critic. And it wasn't quite, you know, there were even in the 90s, there were those people who sort of divided, um, divided the field into uh, critical formalist uh, who would stay within the text somehow and historicist. And if you were doing history, you were called a new historicist. And that was a pejorative in certain circles. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you went through that and uh, you talked about monsters. And I remember that, of course, your addition on Marlowe. Uh, yeah. really caught my attention. I, I, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a Marlowe guy. Yeah. And it needed to be done. I, I remember thinking when it came, I said, there's, thank goodness. Uh, we had Freds and Bowers, but then can it just, is it just going to be Freds and Bowers forever? Right. <laughs> and you, you went and did that. Uh, so you've, you've had this extraordinary career as an editor uh, and you just keep going and going but there is a turn here, and it's it's really in the first decade of uh, of this century that you and it's a it's a fairly big turn. And I wonder what it was yeah. that that made you start to think start thinking this way, moving out into the into the globe, so to speak. Mm, that's a very good question. Um, well, I my my first full time job was in Northern Ireland. Uh, Queen's University of Belfast, where, where I still teach. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not from Northern Ireland um, by upbringing. Yeah. Uh, I'm English. So um, there, was, there was a, you know, a, a, a bit of a kind of um, culture shift for me coming here. Yeah. And I suppose two things happened, really. Um, teaching Shakespeare in an environment that has his historically been sort of discontinuous and contested and where there are different constructions of Shakespeare depending upon who you talk to I became became quite self-conscious about the literary canon mm -hmm. you know self-conscious about my own identity and my own my own positionality and I guess that got me me thinking more broadly and, and sort of expansively and mm -hmm. probably the seeds for thinking about global Shakespeare were in my in my move here at the same time uh, I, I was lucky enough to see um, all of Kenneth Branagh's films screened here for their premieres, including his Hamlet, which um, I saw at the Waterfront Hall here in Belfast in 70 um, millimeter. First time I'd seen a film in, in that widescreen format. And I was just blown away by it. Yeah. And I had to write about it. Uh, Hamlet's always been a favorite of mine from school, but, but right. seeing this, this film version in all of this opulence yeah. Um, really, really um, fired me and ignited me. Yeah. And that's probably where the shift to film came in. Yeah. 
he he did do that, didn't he? Uh, he started with uh, Henry V, and I was just astounded because I felt like I was part of the well, you know, the cool al alternative crowd. Ah, Henry V, what Yates said, it was sustained irony, and then is this young guy comes out and says, "No, nah, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it." We're going to be, a, I'm going to be an English hero. I had a friend who was uh, getting his uh, PhD at a, at a, at a prestigious university in America. And he said that he had uh, become attracted to this uh, French woman and he decided to take her on a date. And he stupidly took her to a kind of premiere in the town. of Henry the Fifth. And she right. didn't, she, it didn't work out at all for him. Uh, yeah. But uh, I thought it was just, you know, the way he approached that. And then he did Hamlet and he did Hamlet. I still use that. Because yes. it's complete, it's complete, yes. you know. Yes. Unlike uh, uh, Olivier yes. or, or Zeffirelli, you know, and they yes. both yes. have those yes. those have their moments, but uh, yes. it's, it's complete, yes. uh, as complete as we can get. Yes. And uh, and there's there's riveting scenes in that that still yes. I see it every year and uh, see and something. It's got, new. It's got, I mean, you know, whatever one one might think about how he's he's um, he's made that text complete. It's got all of the sub narratives and interstices in, and and the Fortinbras plot is of yeah. itself its own story. He keeps on Fortinbras keeps on coming in with yeah. his approach to Elsmore, and and then it's, it's fully foregrounded at the yeah. close of the takeover. Well, it's inspired me to write on it. And if you have any trouble sleeping at some point, just let me know, and I'll send you my Fortinbras. It's, like, it's so boring. I mean, you have to know so much about the play to even begin yeah, to look, look forward to looking. But at I, I felt like, you know, this uh, that was part of how it was structured because we were taught when we were young. I don't know if we were taught this, but we felt, OK, the guy who couldn't make up his mind is an existential drama. It is about Hamlet, you know, and Branagh comes in and he says, no, it's about history, too. It's about uh the uh, changes in a political structure yes, yes, yes. and the uh, the historical element here is very strongly felt and yes. you can't get the play without getting that. And of course, it's Elizabethan late, 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 late Elizabethan England. You have all of this anxiety and uh, sure, sure. about uh, the change of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the monarchy. Who is it going to be? That kind of thing. And here you have it like Shakespeare seems to always do playing it off on you know, another country, another time. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that, that that's the, um, the real coup, really, of that interpretation, that he, he captures that fin de siècle anxiety. Uh, you know, he rehistoricizes Hamlet from Elizabethan period to, to another period. And I, I think it's also something uh, going on with, uh, with adaptations of Hamlet globally, if yeah. one looks at where the, 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 the creative moments are in film history and, and where the particular parts of the world are. I think Hamlet attracts to itself a cachet as a, as a narrative about regime change that yeah. then lends itself to situations where these questions are, are in the air. Yeah, and just how fragile all of that is, how fragile everything uh, is. Uh, just a stunning, uh, stunning performance. Now you're in, you're in Belfast. And of course, mm. that's Kenneth Branagh's, uh, of course, the recent movie about his childhood yeah. and so forth. And uh, you are involved with the uh, Kenneth Branagh uh, archive. Yes. And I'm, I'm very interested in, in that. Mm. What is, uh, what's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, many years ago, I guess I, I became, uh, partly because you know, I've always been interested in archives and exploring, um, you know, manuscript repositories um, in the first part of my work and then kind of film archives in the, in the latter part of my work. Um, I've always been very interested in that. And I was, I, I, I was becoming concerned about how many repositories from the UK were going elsewhere, not, not staying in the UK. Uh -huh. uh, so I... Um, I wrote to, to Branagh's people and, and, and tested out the possibility of, uh, of a donation, got a very gracious, um, welcoming reply. So it started simply with a letter asking, asking about what was happening to, to the materials. We, we now have a, a substantial body of work reflecting Branagh's career right from his early Billy plays uh, to, to more recently. Um, it encompasses um, theatre and film. 
uh, this correspondence. And there are a lot of reviews of, of the plays and the films, meaning that you can plot a trajectory of reception of Branagh's work nationally and internationally. And, and we use it in, in, in PhD, we use the, the archive is used in PhD projects, it's used in educational projects, um, it's used in public facing exhibitions and conferences. There's a conference taking place next week on, on Branagh here in Belfast. Oh. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's nice that it's being used in this way, and it's also important that it's used in this way. Yeah, well, you asked me by email about uh, teaching, you know, using film for teaching. And of course we do, uh, and uh, titles of classes and so forth. And I, I sort of am apologetically have to admit that in, in the uh, institutional structure where I work, the titles for classes would be like for mine in Japanese, it would be lecture on British history, which is uh, inaccurate. And then I make a, a syllabus. And of course, by the time anybody gets into the class, they know it's gonna all be Shakespeare. So we're, we're gonna have trouble finding titles from the websites, but from individual teachers, if I can get out to enough teachers, I can see how they might, um, I can find out from them how they might structure. I don't think, this is something that's a little different from Japan to maybe the UK where you have students who have studied Shakespeare in high school, right? And then by the time they get to college, they, if they're still gonna do Shakespeare, they're interested in doing something new. So let's do mm -hmm. film adaptation. Let's talk about how in a slow point, let's say in Hamlet, you know, I've noticed this for years and years is there, there are slow points in Hamlet. You know, you just, just kind yeah. of op operatic, you have to build it up. Yeah. And, yeah. and Brano's so good at just circling that camera around the actors, yeah. you know, during the slow yeah. points, the right. introduction of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and, you know, just yeah. having it moving from I'll, one I'll room also, to the, yeah. Just, I mean, just in terms of practicality, you have to give the performer who's doing Hamlet a break, don't you, from, from time course. to time? Of course. And so uh, I, tr I try to point that out in my class, but I'm not an expert on, on those kinds of things, you know, uh, making. But you do notice that after seeing it time and again, uh, cer certain things that are just part of the genius of direction, uh, the yeah. genius of act acting. And, uh, uh, and I always try to explain to my students, uh, because we have to spend so much time on the language itself. I do teach it in English in Shakespeare's language, I think is very important. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like when I was a not the best student in the world uh, reading Latin, uh, that we went slowly, we didn't read like Romans. And mm -hmm. uh, same with any kind of language you try to learn. And so we'll go slowly, but we we do that. But I still do want them to understand the um, it's not, I don't want to say collision, but it is kind of a creative collision between um, a creative artist living now coming across this material. And that yeah. same kind of impact was there in, in Shakespeare when you start looking at sources, as, as you, of course, have done very much. Um, I, I want them to understand that. And in a way, it, in a way, it's because it can happen because of what wasn't written down. I mean, wouldn't we love to have stage directions for Hamlet, but that would have killed it, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's that's another value aspect of adaptation that um, one can come across a number of adaptations that create a backstory for a character yeah. in a way that a play doesn't do. This is where, where adaptation can amplify. And those things can be very revealing and illuminating. And similarly, there are adaptations which provide prologues. Which, which extend from the end of, uh, of the Shakespearean play and give us another narrative, making up in a way for a sense of loss. Yeah, yeah, or positioning it. I just finished an article, I think I'm finished. I hope I'm finished, if the, if the editor so allows, uh, mm -hmm. with a couple of my uh, uh, Japanese colleagues on uh, the local, uh, localized theater productions with a focus not on the big, the big theater, but these smaller groups in, uh, and I'll send, you know, if you want any of this information, we will be happy to share it. Uh, and also how Shakespeare appears in uh, anime and manga and manga yeah. turned into anime and anime turned into a series, you know, how yes. it uh, yes. goes from print to uh, a visual medium. And then yeah. how this works through this new media universe that yeah. we're in now. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and a lot of it. That, so, yeah. Yeah. And that's the great, the great, um, you know, the, the, the pleasure of doing this kind of work that you then have to think about, well, what are the most 
apposite theoretical paradigms to use to talk about those transferences. And, you know, in, in a Japanese context, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but, but I do know that, um, you know, Japanese anime versions of Shakespeare can go from print to, to um, screen animation to feature film and, yeah. and then backwards again. Uh, so there's a there's a whole um, you know kind of circularity of representation that needs attending to, and again the question then becomes, well, what are the best methods for for understanding this? Yeah, um, you focus. You, you of course focused on women in Indian drama. The, yeah. This there's a there's a turnabout in Japanese anime and also the novels that the books are still read by kids here. They still read these uh, popular novels. Uh, kind of like my children read Harry Potter or uh, the uh, vampire stuff, uh, the um, Twilight stuff. My daughter was into that for a while. And uh, these things come along, but thankfully uh, for, it seems every generation for kids to begin reading, but they do here too. And, um, but the audience is largely young women. Whereas I think if we looked into Shakespeare, most, most of the audience would have been young men. Uh, the, yeah. the Tybalt character is appealing to, uh, yeah. not Tybalt, but Mercutio's criticism of Tybalt is appealing to young men who have seen this pretentiousness and bravado out on the streets themselves, that sort of thing. But they, how they transfer that into a uh, largely a young adult women's audience is just fascinating. Absolutely it fascinating. It is. And also the position of woman as auteur and in, in examples like Candy, the, the series which uses some Shakespearean interludes or Osaka Hamlet, um, the, these are these are women anime artists. Yes, the the writers, the artists, and the writers. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are largely, and a lot of the production is done, uh, I think, by by women, and it's just astounding what they come up with. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the um, affairs, uh, setting up uh, Henry the Sixth. You know, if you don't teach Henry the Sixth, it gets rusty very quickly. But uh, mm -hmm. I had to go back and look at it. But uh, one artist was uh, saying, "Okay, we have Richard and we have Henry the Sixth. Let's make them um, sort of semi, maybe possibly lovers, and then make Richard androgyne instead of mm -hmm. humpback or whatever. He's just uh, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere um, in between." Uh, any kind of binary sexual position. You know, they, they're just doing this. And uh, and also Romeo's and Juliet's, you have these extremely randy Ju Ju Juliet sometimes, or uh, Juliet falls in love with her cousin Tybalt instead of Romeo, that kind of thing. Uh, they just play with it uh, yeah. and, and come up with some really astounding stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, because the source material there, Mark, is so good. And to Shakespeare saw the source material and did what he did, and then you see that source. Yeah, yeah. And, and that gets us thinking about all the other huge debate in adaptation studies, which is about Shakespearean universality and, and Shakespearean locality. And of course, the, 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 the paradigm for a long time was these are universal stories that, that mean the same things. Um, but now with emphases on, on local and localized criticism um the the um the template is much more sophisticated and, and finessed and you know we're recognizing how these these narratives which are which are canonical can be sort of you know decanonized and and written against and are upturned and inverted to suit very particularized um moments of uh, of need anxiety preoccupation yeah well, I, I wish we could. I can only implore our audience to just read what you've put out there, uh, because if we started at one, I just I, I wanted to focus a little bit on Japan. In one of your books, there was a mention of the film noir, and it mentions yeah. a place, Nishiogi Kubo. And I, I lived there for eight years in Nishiogi Kubo. And it was this feeling I'm going, I, did, I had no idea. You know, here I should have known this when I was yeah. living there. That this, and I, I do think it was a good place for that. There was a, it's a, a, I kind of have a, a the Japanese word is natsukashi, a kind of homesickness for the, uh, um, mm. uh, the period of time I lived there. It was a happy period, mm -hmm. and, and and now is a happy period too. But that was, mm. and uh, also Shibuya, uh, which is right. I'm in Shibuya now as I'm speaking to you. So all, always, um, not always, but uh, in more recent history. Uh, 
uh, youth culture uh, and the uh, site of the uh, uh, Deguchi, um, the uh, great director Deguchi and the, the uh, Jean Jean Theater, where they did the whole canon in jeans and bare stage, you know, back in the 70s or 60s, I think it started. So there's this whole history here that I'm now after these years, I've uh, started getting more and more interested. And in. I would say over the past five years, I think you provoked uh, more interest. Uh, and uh, I don't know, but, but because you're here, you don't sometimes see what's around you, yeah. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you came and visited, and I hope you can at some point, but if you came and visited, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say, okay, well, we need to show Mark something. And I'll go someplace that's just right down the road for me that I never mm -hmm. go to myself. I will mm -hmm. think sometime during the day, well, you know, after Mark leaves, I'm going to come back here with my wife. And, you know, yeah. I, I love this. this was, and we never do. You know, <laughs> you, you have to you have to have visit, visitors. And I think Japanese feel very much the same way. They love visitors and that sort of thing. But, yeah. you know, that said, now, in your work, when I read the acknowledgments of your work, <laughs> there are so many people mm -hmm. out there that mm -hmm. you are in contact with. It's an, mm. it's an I'm enormous network, isn't it? It's an enormous yeah. Yeah. Uh, network. Uh, yeah. And you are now uh, part of the British, or have been part of the British Shakespeare Association mm. Uh, mm. as a response to the fact that there wasn't one, right? Uh, and, and am I pronouncing that right? The British yeah. uh, Shakespeare yeah. Association? Yeah, the BSA, yeah. And, yeah, you're, you're, one, you're in the media and area. And is there anything coming up there? I know that conferences have been kind of curtailed. They've had to go online, mm. that kind of thing. Mm. But mm. are you back to face-to-face uh, -face at all? And Well, um, first of all, on, on the acknowledgements, I think inevitably with a, with a subject like World Shakespeare's or Global Shakespeare's, these have to be collaborative. There's no one person who can do this all on their own. So yeah, I'm very right. indebted. To scholars who work in this area and right. and, and very um, you know beholden to all the all the people who who help me and answer inquiries uh, and that's not just about content that's also about language and translation so th these these things uh, have have to be of necessity um, uh, you know, plural, sort of plural and multi multivocal. Yes. The BSA, yes, I'm a, I'm a trustee of the of the British uh, Shakespeare Association along with others and. Um, we do our best to, uh, you know, promulgate um, activities in and around Shakespeare in an academic and educational and public facing setting. Uh, our last conference was online. That was during the pandemic. But we have high hopes for our, our next series of conferences. And then your other question, Tom, was about what I do, what I do on the BSA. So I, I yeah. try and um, make visible all the work that's going on in media and performance. Yeah. Um, in and around the country, we've had a few events. We've had some film screenings um, and um, and online talks um, to, to to keep to keep Shakespeare very much in the public eye. Yeah, well, I was sort of throwing those together, kind of unfairly. I was uh, basically uh, to, to 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 come to the point that, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe this is a sense of discovery that I've had just doing this series. You know, because mm. I I was going to invite people here, and now yes. you know we, we couldn't do it. You know, and I had yeah. this money yeah. that I had to spend, and now yeah. we're finding this, and I'm going. I can talk to so many more people, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's this discovery where I'm. All you need to do is to go uh, participate. That because it's the British Association doesn't mean that it's a standoffish. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. I think some of my Japanese yeah. colleagues might be a little bit, oh, these are British. Oh. You know, maybe they feel that we mm -hmm. are. I'm going, no, they'd love to have you in. On, on they the would love, you know, just, yes. and, and I wanted to segue that with the, um, mm -hmm. with the numbers of people that you have worked with and this large, you know, far reaching uh, community outside of the UK and so forth, but just how uh, gracious and how eager. Uh, scholars in the UK, in Belfast, or whether they're at Oxford or Cambridge or wherever they are, uh, I've found nothing but graciousness, openness, and a, a, a and it, like in your case, just this eagerness to communicate uh, beyond mm. the beyond the islands there, you know. And mm. uh, so I, I think I wanted to express that to people who are viewing yeah. that just get involved, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. love to see you, that kind of thing. Well, that, that's very much the message that we're putting out in the BSA. You know, we, we are reaching out. We, we're very 
uh, proud of and and you know wanting to uh, keep up and increase our international membership. Uh, and as for your other point, Tom, I mean, you know, it's it. I think as an academic, I mean, I'm I'm very fortunate to be an academic. It's it's a it's a it's a privilege to be an academic. I probably would have been doing what I'm doing if I'd had another job or trying to do what I'm doing if I'd had another yeah. job because I, I, yeah. I do it so much. And if I'm if I'm in a classroom talking about, you know, the, the subjects that really interest me, I'm thinking of an MA option I did just last semester on, on Shakespeare in Asia. What what you know what more could one ask? Yeah. I was well, I was heading towards your Shakespeare in Asia uh, class and I saw this just before uh, you, you've got a lot out there and I'm going, oh, oh, I missed that. And you're doing Shakespeare in Asia. And so yeah. that, that, we're, that that's where I am right now. So uh, explain a little bit how you've structured that particular class. Uh, so uh, it was a bit of a, a challenge for me because it was getting back to your earlier point, so digital. And, and I'm not the most technologically versatile person, but um, we used a lot of digital resources for that module, uh, both um, both ones which which had been sort of you know purpose built for the module, but also other kinds of resources that the students could could access. And the way in which I structured it, um, I mean, I, I, it's it's getting back to the, the, our conversation of earlier, really about. Um, competitions between texts and adaptations. Mm -hmm. I structured it in terms of a week on a text and a week on a series of adaptations, and then a week on another text, and then a week on the adaptations. I think we only had three Shakespeare plays mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, across the, the whole module. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that the students were sensitized to how to read a literary text, but also sens sensitized to how to read an adaptation. And that, that meant an introduction to film terminology. I would say film terminology is as important as, as poetry and literary and formal technology. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it also entailed a um, sort of op optional aspect where the students were encouraged to go off and find an adaptation independently and come back and do a presentation on it in the light of what they'd learned about literary theory, film theory, and, and, and adaptation theory. And that, that proved very productive. It, it taught me. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah, that's isn't that something, how you set up a class and you walk in and go, oh, uh, I'm going to have to learn how to do this myself as I'm <laughs> teaching it, right? And you and you, you do. Uh, it's, one of, it's one of the joys. Well, I think we've all felt that way, you know, even though we were born in different countries and, of course, my Japanese colleagues, there's one point there where you just know that when you're doing this kind of thing, you're at home, you know, that there's nothing else that you want. And I don't, I don't know enough about your career. My career, it was a, I got lucky. There, mm -hmm. I got lucky a couple of times, and if that luck hadn't happened, now you can say I, I was in a position to be lucky, but mm -hmm. if it hadn't happened, uh, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been a very happy thing. Uh, we, we there's a risky it's a risk uh, to going into this business, and increasingly yeah. over time, where um, uh, we have to, we have to all, constantly uh, remind people that listen, you know, this. <laughs> This, this humanities thing, this thing that we do, this, the public actually does want this. You know, there, there's some vociferous voices out there who may not want it, but uh, uh, so you know, keep us around. And uh, to go back to your note to the to, to Branagh's people, right? I think mm -hmm. I tell my students this all the time, and I tell other people, graduate students, and so forth, that mm -hmm. biblical proverb of uh, asking you receive but sometimes mm. not true but i, I but I, if you don't ask you won't receive well if you don't try you don't know right you, you know just you try if you don't try you don't know yeah uh, it's always worth trying it, it really is it really is and i have been absolutely uh, like when i contacted you you immediately came back and said yeah i'll do this mm. now i don't i i ne i'd never met you before this talk and uh, and I just thought that I, I think that we probably have crossed paths somewhere along the way, I think we have. you know, and uh, and so forth. And I, you know, you're uh, Marlowe, right? I, that mm. I've, I've known your name. I'm going, mm. 
I mean, you know, I'm not going to live to be 5,000 years old. I'm not uh, one of these biblical characters. I better meet this guy if I want to, you know, now, uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you get to a point where you're counting down rather than mm -hmm. counting up. And, uh, and uh, that's just been so just extraordinary that we've had this technology to do it. And that the, yes. uh, uh, and that uh, somehow I mustered, I, I'm, I'm usually a pretty shy guy about this kind of thing, but uh, people have been so warm and receptive. And I keep wanting to push that out there to people who are in the profession that, uh, you know, I, I think you and I, I was talking about the great teachers we had. There were some teachers who could be real, really tough, tough nuts to crack there. You know, they were, they were hard and they were a little not approachable. You know, we, we rebelled against that in our younger days, you know, to be much more open and so forth. But uh, there's still out there is this sense, I think, think that there might be a, uh, you know, an in-group that uh, isn't, uh, wouldn't want to um, talk to you. And I really encourage my Japanese colleagues to, to, to do as much as they can, because there's so much happening over here. Well, I mean, you know, we have to recognize all the, all the dreadful things that the pandemic entailed and uh, all, the, all the sort of horrible pressures and, and, um, and realities. On, on on the digital side, the pandemic has approved um, arguably more leveling than might have been anticipated, uh, particularly in terms of conference online conference attendance, where where um, um, you, you can get greater numbers of, of participants and and things like this, where you know um, hopefully um, larger audiences will will be involved. Yeah, yeah. Over time, over time. Right. And, and I, I'd like to think that over time that uh, I'm, I'm going to do this for some time longer, as, as long as we can get some funding and so forth, but uh, that, that it, it will be a bit of an archive too, that it, it will mark yeah. a point in, in your life, a point in the life of these uh, people. I'm trying to distribute it uh, also with younger mid-career scholars and of course, global scholars. There is a, there's kind of a bias and I'm, my American friends might you know, I'm, I'm probably more focused on, a, say, a German scholar who is working on Shakespeare or a Japanese scholar who is working on Shakespeare because of the, the global nature of the program. But eventually you get to a, a lot of people. Uh, and I could do a lot more of this if I, uh, <laughs> I could do a lot more of this. Well, OK, what I'm going to do then is I want to return uh, as we sort of close up a little bit here. I'd like to return a little bit to the whole notion of what is and isn't Shakespeare. For, okay. for instance, The Godfather is not Shakespeare, right? The mm -hmm. movie The Godfather is not Shakespeare. But if we start looking closely, we might find some Shakespearean elements because, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody who was involved in producing the movie studied Shakespeare at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. a Coppola, you know, would have maybe something in his head I'm wondering where you, where the line is, but I think that don't you don't it's wide. Yes, it, it is Very wide, wide. And, and I think that there's some there's some caveats. Um, and and one is, I don't think any cultural statement has to advertise itself as a Shakespearean adaptation to be read as a Shakespearean adaptation. I don't uh, think it necessarily gives the adaptation any more kudos or authority to bill itself in a particular way in relation to Shakespeare. Rather, I think the issue is the reading practice and the sphere of reception. Yeah. A number of studies going on in adaptation studies at the moment about how you read Shakespeare into something. Now, there are all sorts of cultural issues, pros and cons around that, but I think it's quite productive. And if, you, if you're able to, to, to spot an inference or an echo and, and you are finding that in the, in the fabric of the work that you're attending to, um, the field does indeed become wider and 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 richer and and more interesting for it. Yeah. Well, I, I like this in this transferability. That's where I'm headed with this. Is that it's not just if we take it as a kind of um, let's take it as a, a mathematical formula. If you take Shakespeare as X, you know, you, there's an expansion you can do throughout. Uh, a, a large number of major cult cultural forms, where if you do shed off these um, uh, what garments of uh, that are prohibitive uh, that that make 
people think that it belongs to here and only here, but not there, then you open up many, many other doors of inspiration and creative inspiration and in, in art uh, mm -hmm. for any number of uh, cultures mm -hmm. to come back from, well, let's say back from the, um, the East to the West or whatever. Yeah. I think that that whole, that's, it, it will help to break down a lot of these uh -huh unnecessary divisions. I, I, I agree. And it, and it doesn't have to, have to be Shakespeare. I mean, it can be all kinds of other sort of, you know, founding and foundational texts um, in, in the Indian adaptations that that I'm interested in, in at the moment. I mean, the, the Indian epics are a constant reference point, you know, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, uh, as well as Shakespeare, because the, these are these are all um, cross fertilizing um, elements of, of the matrix of the culture. And what's what's fascinating is is how they they intersect uh, as as well as individuate themselves yeah. in works of adaptation. Yeah, yeah, because in the in the intersection, that's where something new happens, uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and that's that's uh, what we're doing. Well, I uh, I think that you have set up you have set up a platform that uh, will keep you going as long as you want to go. Uh, you, you have you have no worry about running out of things because let's just say world cinema right well that was a few years ago now so yeah. there's you know part two there there's things that yeah. have come out in the past years yeah uh, right. and it's it's just never going to run out you've you've selected the absolutely perfect area of scholarship yeah. it is yeah. you know you it is the 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 river that flows and uh it's just wonderful well i hope that we get to see you in person at some point and by we i'm not using the royal we i'm speaking for my friends in the uh shakespeare association of uh, shakespeare society of japan uh and also my colleagues here uh that uh, it, you know we we really really do i i really do miss conferencing and i'm going to do a little bit of it this year i'm taking off next oh, month and oh, going yeah. uh yeah on an adventure and of course i, I actually into the uh, uk and well you know damn if they don't start wars you know somewhere in between me and the you know and I'm, I'm thinking today and i might have to go around the other way um but uh you know yeah. the, it, it, wasn't the pandemic enough you know could uh, couldn't yeah. we um you know settle down a little bit but things just um, are a little bit crazy now. They still are, yeah, uh, yeah. but I'm I'm hoping we'll get back to that. Now I'm hoping we'll get mm -hmm. back to the uh, place where we can bring scholars here. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, it's just absolutely delightful to have to be able to talk to you. You, you yeah. know, in, in your morning. Yeah. Well, this has been terrific, Tom, and, and yeah. you know I'm honoured to be here, and uh, thank you so much for for reaching out. And um, it's it's been a delight and and um, to, to to talk to you to hear your views. And it's really got me thinking about all sorts of additional things. Well, we can do this again, too, when some new stuff comes out. Okay, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.